Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. You know, the scripture says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will also lie. And I just think that the governor of this state proposed to us a heartless budget. And everybody in this state, every person in this state should be outraged by the way the, the governor proposed that we spend a $150 billion plus budget. And in that budget, he even wants to increase the tuition for five years on CUNY and SUNY students, $300 a year. In that budget, he's only talking about $25 million for poverty, $25 million. In that budget, even though Campaign for Fiscal Equity is owed $4.4 billion, he proposes $266 million. Last year, there was $75 million for struggling schools. Now we're calling them community schools, which is a good thing. He proposes $100 million for 144 schools. Last year, it was only 75 schools, uh, 21 schools for $75 million. So no question in my mind that this governor has to be out of his mind to present something like that to us and think we're not going to adjust it and do some things. But the reason why I'm voting no for this budget resolution is because the hope that the children of this state have is in you. I don't see it in the Senate or the governor, is in you. And I've learned over the year, this budget process, when we do this one house budget, this is what's going to be brought to the negotiating table. These numbers are going to go down. These numbers are going to go down. You can't start with $1.1 billion for campaign for fiscal equity. That's what we did last year, and it went down to $450 million. We have to say to the children of this state that if they can wipe out the GEA, $434 million, I know that's much less than $4.4 billion, but the Senate threw down the gauntlet and said, we are wiping that out. We are not voting for any budget unless we don't have to deal with the GEA anymore, and they got it. All $434 million. The governor proposed $189 million. They got it. So we do 25 percent, $1.1 billion of the CFE, they get 100% of the GEA. Some of you will benefit from the GEA. 25% of it will go to the high-need schools. I understand that. But we've been dealing with the Campaign for Fiscal Equity for nearly a decade, a decade. And that was put forth because of the discrimination and allocation of resources to high-need schools, which is a cold word for black and brown neighborhoods and they're in our schools. At some point, we got to raise the bar here. At some point, we got to raise the bar here. We got to say at least 50% of the campaign for fiscal equity. And they said, where are you going to get the money from? Where are you going to get the money from? We have having difficulty finding money out of a $156 billion budget. I don't understand that. Well, actually, I do understand. It's about budget priorities. And believe me, I'm voting no for the opposite reason of some of my colleagues over here. I think we should spend more. I don't think we should allow the governor to impose a 2 percent spending cap. I don't think we should allow that. And yes, we went up to 4 percent here. It should be at least 5 percent to pay all the bills and enhance things. Every year, they're going to cut things. And then we claim victory, we claim victory when we restore cuts that they knew was going to be restored anyway. That's some of the budget dance we did in the city council. Cut everything you want, and we're focusing on a few pennies in the budget out of a $150 billion budget. So I wanted us to be stronger this time around. Make the numbers higher so we don't have to come toward the end 
and see the things that you are going to be celebrating that you did now. And I'm glad we did the millionaire's tax. That's a good thing. I'm 100% for the $15 minimum wage, even though that's only $30,000 a year, which is something you can't live off anyway. People say, well, Charles, you got to compromise. You got you to gotta learn how to play the game. You, gotta, you can't get everything because you can't get perfection. If you want to know my perfection, we'd be making $30 an hour. We'd be paying well, $4.4 billion, the whole thing off. My presence here is a compromise. So I'm just trying to say to us, at least, at least, I'm glad you caught that one, at least, the least we could do is have the numbers high enough so when we get to the negotiating table that we will be able to get decent numbers out of this instead of bringing it very, very low and not coming near what we're proposing today. And then finally, I will never vote for a budget that has seven years, seven years of mayoral control because it's a Democratic mayor who's clueless about education and we had a, Demo a Republican mayor with Bloomberg who's also clueless and a businessman who's worse <laughs> and a businessman. When you look at education, we have a $25 billion budget for the state. That's New York City's budget for the education. It's $25 billion. 1.1 million children. Why is it that we are the only place where there's no school boards. Every other county across the state has school boards. We have a little dictatorial mayor that's going to try to run our schools. And Bloomberg was worse. Bloomberg was the worst mayor for education you would ever want to have. He hired Kathy Black. Do you know Kathy Black? She was the most clueless human being around education that I've ever met. She was with Hearst Magazines and came. We got her out of town in a little bit. She just lasted a minute. But anybody that hires Kathy Black, we should kick him out of the country. He should later lose his citizenship. That's how bad she was. But this education issue, we cannot propose seven years for the mayor. Right now, when you look at the test scores, the children are still below 50 percent, and the black and Latino children are even worse under de Blasio, and they were horrible under Bloomberg. Why don't we support one year extension of mayoral control and put a commission to that to come up with a new school governance that can really help our children and really lay out the resources like they need to be laid out? So I want to say to you, my no vote is not that I don't appreciate all the work that you've done. It's not that I don't appreciate the fact that you have things in there that I support. But I will always value our children first, especially the children in poverty. And I think at the end of this, with these low numbers, we're going to be hurting in the richest state probably in the world. We live in the richest country that the planet Earth has ever known, the United States of America. There's no country that ever was as rich as this country, and there's not too many countries that are productive and positive that have as much poverty and have as much unemployment and things that we have in this country. If we can't take a $4.4 trillion national budget, a $150 billion state budget, and an $83 billion city budget, and more equitably distribute it so that we do something for real about poverty, about our children, about the black and Latino neighborhoods that are stu suffering from the systemic racism of a greedy capitalist system, we have to do better. So with that, I will be voting no on this budget. Record the vote.
Please no. <laughs> We have members who will explain their vote, so if you are voting and leaving, do it quietly. Mr. Zembrowski. Thanks, uh, Mr. Speaker. I'm going to support this bill today, and it made uh, significant investments and protections for my residents uh, in suburban Rockland County, specifically uh, protecting the STAR program, which is the single biggest property tax relief program in the state of New York. We need to ensure that it does continue to grow at a modest growth, and we need to ensure that it continues to be a property tax reduction. Um, secondly, there's nine districts in the state of New York that still don't have full-day kindergarten. It's unacceptable. It doesn't follow the standards for, for some kids on one side of the street to be getting a different education than another side of the street. It's unacceptable. And we included my five-year phase-out program that will provide an additional uh, $25 million, $37 million total to these districts is extremely helpful. I'll be voting in the affirmative for these reasons. However, I do have to say that, that we need to do more in terms of assisting districts and areas that have been devastated by tax certiorities with power plants. It's unacceptable that some areas may be helped and other areas may not be helped. In my home district, a school district owes $220 million, an annual budget of $170 million. It's devastation. It's unacceptable. When we look at these types of tax certiorities, we need to do so in an equitable manner. You know, we've seen districts and areas throughout this state helped. And what I ask is that we move towards April 1st, that we help all those districts, all those areas, and represent and, and recognize that some areas have been dealing with these things for a decade. So as we look at coal power plants going offline, we also look at other areas. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. Look forward to working with all my colleagues towards an equitable resolution April 1st. Mr. Skoufis. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, too, will be voting in favor of this resolution. You know, there's a lot of good to be said about what we have here. My strong belief is that government exists to ensure a decent and humane society. And as my colleague just noted, there is much in this bill from, from ensuring full-day kindergarten for all of our school districts, to eliminating the GEA, to providing significant tax cuts to homeowners who are struggling, small business tax cuts. But most notably, I want to mention, Mr. Speaker, I was at SUNY New Paltz with one of my colleagues just this past weekend. And there are so many students all around this state, thousands upon thousands, who are leaving our public colleges with 20, 30, 40, 50 thousand dollars in student debt. Our public colleges. And at a time when we have presidential candidates talking about free tuition at two-year colleges or free tuition even at four-year public colleges, we have this debate here during this budget negotiation about whether to increase tuition at our public colleges at SUNY and CUNY. This so-called rational tuition plan, I believe, is anything but rational. There is nothing rational, rational about sending more students to their parents' basements to live in after graduating because they can't afford to find an apartment or a home. So I am very pleased in our budget resolution here we say enough is enough. We say no more tuition increases. And I hope we take this first step toward actually making SUNY and CUNY more affordable and one day tuition free. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Scoopers. Ms. People Stokes. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I rise to um, <clears throat> explain my vote on this budget resolution that is quite frankly not binding, but it does lay out the principles of our Democratic colleagues on where we'd like to see the budget process go. There are uh, many, many good things in this proposal, Mr. Speaker, and there are a few things that I still think yet need to be debated. I look forward to that debate, 
And I'm sure at the end of the day, we'll come down uh, with a positive budget for all citizens of New York State. Also, while I'm standing, Mr. Speaker, just want to commend uh, Mr. Farrell and his ability to stand for hours on hours responding to questions from both sides of the aisle and dealing with this budget issue. It is very commendable what he does, and I, I really do appreciate him. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. People Stokes. Ms. Warner. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise to explain my vote. Um, as my colleagues have said, there are some good things and there are some, some things that are not so good for our districts in this. There are some things that we can support. There are some things that we can't support. Um, for two years now, I've been uh, a real uh, fighter for restoring the gap elimination adjustment funds um, and fully funding education for all of our schools, and particularly our rural upstate schools. And I am very pleased today um, that the Assembly has taken the step of restoring the GEA funds, as well as setting us on the path for um, restoring all of the foundation aid over a series of years. Uh, support for education is really uh, just so fundamental, and I'm very proud of the Assembly's stance with respect to public education. But we need to do better for our farmers and for our small businesses. Uh, and I look forward over the next several weeks uh, working with you, my colleagues, to try and make sure that we are creating a strong and robust economy for our farmers and for our small businesses. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ms. Lipton. Yes, Mr. Speaker, I just wanted to speak briefly and uh, give my support to this uh, our, our budget resolution. Uh, the education uh, funding, of course, is particularly important. Uh, us restoring $1.1 billion in foundation aid, restoring, restoring the full GEA at $434 million, very important uh, aid to education. Also, higher ed, the freezing of tuition over two years, adding in $89.3 million to SUNY uh, to backfill that, um, the money that would have been raised from a, an increased tuition. Uh, so both of those are very important. Also, we have significant new money for housing and for transportation, among other important public goods. This is a very good budget resolution, and I'm very pleased to be able to uh, support it today. Thank you. Ms. Fahey. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise to explain my vote as well. I'll be voting in the affirmative. Uh, I know this is just a, a, a first critical step, and it is our resolution, but I think it's incredibly encouraging. Uh, be it on the environment, uh, with the increase in environmental funds, education funds, higher education, the uh, truly significant water and sewer infrastructure funds, as well as uh, transportation. Um, with regard to some specifics, the education, as others have said, uh, it is a record-setting year. We know we have a ways to go, but in terms of Foundation Aid and GEA, I do think that this is a, a, a critical and significant step as well as adding in funds, uh, one of the largest increases in years for after school funding, which is also incredibly important, particularly for working parents. Uh, that said, uh, literacy as well has a, a small increase and a very important one. Uh, with regard to that, I'm also particularly pleased with the community schools, the increase that we are adding, and I commend a number of colleagues, including People Stokes, who has advocated for this money. Um, within the community schools, we've also added a provision that would increase building aid such that schools that are moving toward a community schools model can get increased state aid on those renovations and on those expansions, which will be very, very important. Uh, transit, I mentioned, upstate transit is incredibly important, especially for uh, workers uh, as we... Um, as they move toward jobs, particularly as they, um, with the more jobs are spread out, the more we need to make sure workers are getting there. And we have a somewhat unprecedented increase in operating aid for upstate transit as well as uh, capital monies. Um, finally, bikes and pedestrians is another important piece. And uh, so it's with the host of these increases, I know this is just the resolution, but I do find this is one of the most encouraging resolutions that we have put forward, and I vote in the affirmative. Thank you. Mr. McGee. Yes, Mr. Speaker, to explain my vote, uh, this resolution, of course, is just stating the Assembly's position on the proposed budget that's down the road from here, and I just want to uh, 
make it known that there are some areas of the budget uh, that I don't agree with. Uh, one of them is partially with agriculture. The minimum wage, I think we need to talk about that some more. But anyway, the aid to education, the highway aid, the roads aid and so on is very significant in this budget and that's very good. Uh, you've already heard from others about the position on education. So with that being said, I vote yes. Mr. Abenaki. Oops. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise to uh, support this budget. Um, this budget uh, very clearly demonstrates that the assembly majority supports the people in our state, that we understand our community's needs. First of all, with respect to libraries, as the library chair, I'm very pleased that the assembly majority is increasing operating aid by 5.5% and capital funding by 70%. Uh, with respect to education, we're making a very significant addition to the education budget. We're increasing foundation aid by quite a bit. And most importantly, we're eliminating the gap elimination adjustment, which has penalized so many of our school districts. And lastly, with respect to people with special needs, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, first with early intervention, we've rejected the unwise proposals uh, by the executive branch, which would impede access to early intervention services. With respect to special act schools and 853s and 4201 schools for the blind and the deaf, we've made a 2% increase to the funds available to them. And with respect to older people, people outside of school who've graduated from school, we're increasing uh, the funding available by $200 million to uh, make sure that the agencies that take care of people with special needs can meet a minimum wage increase. We're increasing uh, services by $10 million. And we're providing for the first time in a long time additional monies for housing for people with special needs, a total of $100 million over the next five years. I think this budget, Mr. Speaker, is a good budget. It provides for many of the needs, and I hope that this will lead us to a position where the final budget meets the same needs. So therefore, I vote in the affirmative. Mr. Blake. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. There, there are many things about this the budget that I proudly support, and, and just to put a, a personal a point on this, uh, Mr. Speaker and colleagues, when uh, allow me to convey my appreciation to Speaker Aisty. Uh, I represent the district that's owed the most money for CFE uh, in the city. Uh, as of last year, it was 76 million. This year, it's 61 million. Uh, what we're doing for foundation aid has transformative impact. Uh, we have the second largest NYCHA uh, population of anyone in the city, and when we think about the the proposals of uh, helping on public housing that also has transformational impact. When we think about the anti-poverty initiative, my, my gratitude on that collectively to the leadership, because being poor doesn't have a race, it doesn't have a color. So whether you're downstate or upstate, we should obviously care about that in a very impactful way as well. But lastly, I think when you see what a budget does, it demonstrates values and appreciation. And when I think about for the CUNY schools, especially those of us in the Bronx, for BCC, for Lehman, for Hostos, uh, we needed to stand up for them, and that only happened because of what happened in this house. And we need to stand up for the boys and young men of color that are struggling in this society. Sometimes we don't want to be very direct about it, but the recent stats indicate that one out of three black men in this nation will serve some time in prison, given the current statistics. So MBK is transformational, it's necessary, and the work for MBK, for the MWE programs, and what the speaker and others have done uh, truly demonstrates a family first budget, and I have to express my uh, absolute gratitude and it's one of the many reasons why I probably support this budget. Mr. Linares. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I rise to commend the speaker and Chairman Farrell uh, for the work along with the staff that they've done uh, to present to, to us uh, this budget resolution. Uh, this resolution speaks to the needs of communities and neighborhoods, particularly those that have high concentration uh, of poverty and are challenged. Whether we look at education needs, as uh, the budget here really speaks to uh, not only children and youth, uh, but also uh, the need for us to have uh, a workforce uh, that can make a difference, and that means we need to have 
uh, them attend college and prepare for, for life. When we look at housing and the crisis that we face uh, across the state, but particularly in New York City, uh, this budget speaks to that as well. When we look at needs, uh, the needs of the most vulnerable, whether the uh, homeless uh, or those who are seeking housing, this budget speaks to that. Uh, the bottom line is, is that we are speaking to the needs that neighborhoods uh, uh, have, that families, particularly working families that are struggling, have. And that's why I'm proud uh, to support uh, this budget resolution uh, today and hope that uh, the, the outcome of this process uh, really reflects what we intend to send as a message uh, in this uh, chamber. Uh, to New Yorkers, that we're standing, we understand the challenges that we all face as New Yorkers, and this reflects uh, precisely the priorities that we have neighborhood by neighborhood across this state. Thank you, and I vote on the affirmative. Thank you, Mr. Linares. Are there any other votes? Announce the results. Ayes 98, noes 42. The resolution has passed. Mr. Morelli. Yes, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Do we have any resolutions to take up at this time? We have numerous other re resolutions. We'll take them in one vote. All those in favor of the resolutions signify by saying aye. aye. Resolutions are adopted. <laughs> Mr. Morelli. Yes, uh, Ms. Schimmel will not be making any further announcements this afternoon, uh, Mr. Speaker, but I understand Mr. Crouch would like to, if you'd please recognize him. Mr. Crouch, for the purposes of a announcement. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. There will be an immediate uh, members-only Republican conference in the parliament. Members-only conference for the Republicans in the parlor. Mr. Morelli. Yes, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I now move that the assembly stand adjourned until 11 a.m. Tuesday, March 15th, tomorrow being a session day. The assembly will stand adjourned.